Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry. I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. So I was suggested this video over on Discord, and I didn't really know what to think and how it could be relevant to what I do on my channel. This video is called History of the Entire World According to Bread. So this is by The Food Theorists, and I was told that this is from MatPat. So I'm going to give this a shot. All right, the original video is linked down below. Make sure you watch that. Watch that first. Then come on back, and let's check out the history together here. All right, let's get started. All right, you guys wanted a history teacher to check out, I guess, the history that's in this video? That's my job. Let's see how they do with it. This is a planet covered with people, different people. I thought Matt was done. People. For thousands of years, was this all before his announcement? Join other little people to take over other little people. The little people that conquer the other little people will all use one thing and one thing only. Bread! Okay, right away. Hello, Internet! Welcome! Right away, he's not wrong. Uh... One of the most underappreciated movers, aspects of the movement of history is food. And with wheat and the uh, domestication of like wheat was one of the game changers in the evolution of our entire species. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but this is not, this shouldn't be a hot take. You know, the food theory, the show that's laying down a trail of bread. I had no idea this leads channel existed. World domination. No Today's game theory. theory has been on my bucket list, my bread basket list for a while now. And no, it might not be Dude, the most searchable. Bread. No, it might not be the trending thing on TikTok, but it's always been trending in one place. My stomach. I'm talking yeah. about bread. This episode is I an homage bread. to the humble loaf from baguette to brioche, soda bread to cornbread, sourdough, chapata, challah to chapati, or just those unlimited breadsticks over at Olive Garden. I may some my thinner days at the beginning of this channel that was when i was on uh i was on like low to no carb diets and man i missed bread that's the thing i missed most even more than sugar bread love them all and while you might think that it's the pillowy texture i like the science of baking or some sort of weird dark lore about the pillsbury doughboy <laughs> oh no my friend it's the history? my feelings for bread go much deeper i love Please. bread because bread means one thing power there's nothing more okay. powerful in this entire world than the mighty loaf who run the world bread you look skeptical i get it all you carbophobes out there don't think that you could take over the world using just bread if you doubt the power of this puffy hot dog holder that only means one thing that dude he's just the next eight Minutes or gassing so, up bread the right most now. Way possible that bread is the most powerful substance on the planet. To show you this, I'm gonna have to tell you the entire history of the. Did, did, did somebody make sure that the president of bread saw this? Hey, bread's been a major thing though. Hey, French Revolution, that basically it basically happened because bread was short. <laughs> World in bread. By the time we're done, you'll not only have a new favorite food, but you'll know how to use it to conquer the world. Grab a slice for the road, everyone, because this one is gonna be a go make some toast. Now, if we're talking about bread conquering the world, we're gonna need to get a little handle on the world itself. So for all of you who weren't finalists in the geography B in high school, congratulations on doing literally anything else. I got you covered. We're just gonna catch you up here. I'll help this you is the world. Okay. And this right here, that's me. Me, showing you how to conquer the whole thing with carbs. Baguettes. Your next step will be to forget everything that you learned in 12 years of history class or whatever. The only thing that you no, really need don't to do understand that. about history is bread. Bread, like all of us, starts from humble beginnings here in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia where it's 30,000 years ago and bread isn't bread yet. It's instead just some random seeds of grain. Here we are a little... So bread was... Uh, bread, uh, wheat, and, and, and ancestors. We understand that 30,000 years ago, what we consider wheat today, you know, to make bread was not like it is today. Okay. It's the evolution of all foods, but there in the, between the Tigris and Euphrates, Mesopotamia, one of the first places to domesticate food. That was a game changer for human society because, um, for much of the world, uh, people were hunter gatherers. Nobody stayed in one place. And the big reason for that is plants, right. And what today would be like our, our grains and stuff. Um, had not been cultivated in the way that it is today. So it wouldn't be possible to live in one place. But as better seeds are identified and then you start to get experimentation and those seeds get better and more nutritious and you get higher calories per acre from your yields, it allowed people for the first time in history to live in one place. That's the birth of society. And that's a different from the thousands or whatever you want to call about it of years before, right, 30,000 years ago, which is most of human history. Why it all of a sudden changed and the domestication of food is only a speck in the history, long history of humans.
little ancient people freshly emerging from the primordial ooze, wandering around killing things with sticks and trying to figure out which leaves we can eat. Someone has the weird idea to eat some wheat seeds growing in the wild. They smash <laughs> them up a little, mix them with some water, and drop them into the fire until they're crispy. Voila! Bread. It's not much to look at. It, it would have been gross. It's a little cracker, so gross. but we love it. Because let Probably me tell no you, it's better than eating bugs and leaves. The record of ruins from this time shows that bread is first found in ceremonial and sacred places, meaning that we thought it was pretty cool. A special awesome little cookie of carbs, and we love these ugly little wheat slabs so much that we're like, hey, what if we stopped wandering around and just waited for more of these wheat seeds to grow? And so now something he hasn't mentioned yet that's really important to understand is you know, wheat and some of the the the, the grains like that could be stored long term. Okay, much of what hunter-gatherer people ate uh could go bad. Um, especially obviously when it comes to like meat, it can go bad quickly. The biggest equalizer in population history, okay, has been famine. Stored grains reduce famine, therefore human populations grow. Oh, that's exactly what we did. When you learn history, you think people just stopped being nomadic and then started to develop agriculture. But really, it was the other way around. We were like, hey, bit of bread addiction happening here. This is the best thing since sliced itself. So we're just going to sit here until more of it grows. And thus, civilization was born because people wanted to eat more toast. Good job, from man. From there, the popularity of bread, like any great celebrity, goes from fact to legend. For ancient Mesopotamian civilizations, wheat becomes deeply entwined with mythology. The Sumerians developed Nisaba, the goddess of grain and writing. She's a very big deal. Over time, bread yep, hits the road for carried by the people who are still wandering nomads all the way over to ancient Egypt where there are some cool new kids in town yep. calling themselves the pharaohs. Turns out the Egyptians have a little annual event that's pretty helpful for growing wheat. They Floods. all live next to this enormous river, Nile, the Nile which was full of crocodiles and baby Moseses and was also very good at doing one thing every year, having a flood. The yearly flooding of the Nile, which is part of the natural water cycle of the region, ends up leaving behind a massive area full of well-watered crops with no hauling of water necessary. No digging fancy irrigation lines that no one's invented yet to grow these crops. At they will soon. Until bread comes around. They came along Turns with out, it. people are gonna... Okay, um, one major feature of the Nile that he, he said there is, first off, it, it's, it's yearly, okay? It is predictable, like to the date, every year, when it was. And that is different than Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates, they flood unpredictably and violently. The other thing about how the Nile floods too is it's gentle. It's gentle. It's not just like rushing all the time. That's why you have these destructive flood myths coming from Mesopotamia. But the Nile, predictable and very, uh, like I said, gentle, meaning you could prepare for it. The Nile was a much better place to cultivate this type of grain than it was in Mesopotamia do a lot of things to get themselves more bread. So they invent elaborate irrigation channels, canals, dams that'll be used all over the world for thousands of years, all inspired by everyone's love of growing more bread. The Egyptians are also conducting bread. wild scientific experiments to find more ways to eat bread. Kind of like the Alton Browns of the desert, experimenting with yeah. grinding up the wheat and actually mixing it with other stuff. Up to this point, most people were just kind of toasting up wheat seeds and packing them together with some water, then scalding the whole thing in a fire to make a flat, crackery little slab. But the Egyptians they get wild with it. They make a paste out of ground up wheat and water, which they then leave out in the sun, inventing the entire process of yeast fermentation. Now, other civilizations had done fermentation before. I mean, we've invented beer at this point. We're not monsters. But this is like a whole new frontier for bread. Like the latest TikTok craze, everyone wanted to get their hands on this bread that actually rises for exactly the same reasons that That's we a follow TikTok trend. Today. The clout. The upper classes can now lord it over the little peons still eating flatbread made out of yucky barley instead of cool, puffy wheat. Bread is such an essential part of life that it becomes completely linked with the Egyptian gods and all religious practices involve offerings of bread. The uh, well, it, it, not necessarily bread specifically and exclusively gave way to deities, but in ancient times and most every culture, you had deities that represented food production. Okay. Um, people thought that there were supernatural forces at work for agriculture, that there was some kind of divine intervention with growing seasons, right? Because a lot of the, the natural you know, world could also be very destructive, could be very beneficial, and they believe that gods were behind that. And uh, usually, you know, you had, if you had a, uh, if you were in a fertile place like the Nile, okay, um, your god is probably a very, you think of him as, as a very, uh, like, kind god, because the things that allow you to grow so so efficiently is so common 
that it seems like the God is a very kind God. But also you want to make sure you're on that God's good side because they understood once you become reliant on this like food production and this this crop production that if it was to say, you know, a famine goes and nothing's growing, that would be devastating. So you want to make sure that God that's in control of these uh, harvests is one that's on your side. And in Mesopotamia, what they did for that was, you know, build pyramid temples called ziggurats. Right. In the Nile, they're doing their own sacrifices and things like that. So it's common amongst the ancient world to have deities that represent food production. God Osiris, who is not only the Egyptian god of death and rebirth, but also agriculture, has illustrations showing wheat literally growing out of his body to symbolize resurrection. During festivals in ancient Egypt, priests bake something known as the divine bread, which is bread in the shape mm. of Osiris, who Ooh. himself was also bread. We're just gonna go with it. Isis, the sister of Osiris, is the goddess of wheat and barley, and by proxy beer, and is also known as the divine baker. She's Fun fact, uh, the people that built the pyramids, Okay, the workers. Um, now, how the pyramids kind of worked was in the not harvesting season. So, in the in the time period uh, in the yearly calendar between planting wheat and harvesting wheat was time when those people would often go work on uh, like the pyramids. Okay, especially depending on the the, the years in the old in the old uh, uh, dynasty or the old kingdom. I mean, and uh, one of the ways that they were. Uh, compensated for that because it wasn't really slave labor okay um was a compensation there might have been slaves but like we have a lot of evidence that people were paid to do this one of them was in beer beer was uh we've seen was one of the currencies to compensate people that working on the pyramids Supposedly Get responsible paid beer. for teaching mankind how to make bread. Really shafting the Sumerians who were doing it 20,000 years earlier. Everyone's plagiarizing these days. But not only is bread making mythology happen, it's making everything happen. Want to build a pyramid using slave labor? Gonna have to feed them. Bread's gonna come in handy for that. Want to raise an army? Just tell them they to need, pack some bread and a spear. They're good to go. Well. Want to trade with the nations around you? Here's something that might not have been seen before. It's bread. It turns out the Egyptians could grow bread well, and a lot of it, to feed a lot of people. Admittedly, not everyone needed the whole yeast rising process the israelites for example are like you guys are mean you keep your stupid bread bubbles we got better things to do and so they take their matzah and flee egypt but the rest of the world is like put that bread in my face right now egypt is incredibly powerful because they have the power of the bread and this will become the and if you control food you control lives you control the thing that people need to survive um, they became an exporter they grew so much that they could export it and um, import things one of the great uh, destinations for exporting egyptian wheat was greece um, greece could then sell back uh, one is stuff they get from mining which greece was good at so your gold silver that kind of thing and also of course wine you know they grow grapes so one of the the, the most popular traded things was wheat for wine the pattern for every other nation who gets and grows a lot of wheat. Just watch, because next, bread does something amazing. It crosses the sea. Well, I mean, the sailors cross the sea. The bread actually lives rent-free on the boats, just like it does in my mind. And now bread is in Greece. As soon as it hits the shores of Greece, bread is the hot item, which you can see reflected again in a huge number of Greek myths and gods that they couldn't grow it in Greece. the power of bread. The main one is Demeter, the goddess of the harvest, agriculture, and specifically grains. She gives... Agri uh, arable land is scarce in Greece. Greece is hot. It is mountainous. That's why they had to import a lot. But the people that did own that small percentage of land that could be uh, farmed upon had a very privileged place in society. And the elites that came through and ruled Greek city-states were landowners because of how scarce really really good land was big girl boss vibes the greeks are like let's eat bread with every meal which sounds like a dream but it's gonna mean that they need a lot more bread so much in fact that in 600 bc they invent the first ever closed oven specifically for making bread before people were just cooking everything over open the first fire ones before the egyptians much less I know that. fuel efficient and left less control over the temperature using closed ovens though the greeks could suddenly make oodles of bread with less fuel and more consistency allowing them to feed even more people than the egyptians could just like the Ooh. egyptians and their irrigation systems systems the oven is basically just there so the greeks can they get made it more efficient and you know what it works in 168 bc they develop a baker's guild and before you know it the yeah, bread they guild. make is on its way to rome and persia as people push to the east to get access to the really crazy stuff like salt they spread bread to the areas that we now know as western asia it's here that the new bread making techniques really take off wheat is a key part of the persian empire especially when it comes to flatbread they spread flatbread throughout the middle east and central asia because it's durable it's easy to transport and it's a cinch to make even when you're traveling without any sort of special equipment something to note um it's you're gonna see you're gonna see it it's spread okay this type of agriculture from east to west 
And why you're going to be able to do that is, fortunately, geographically speaking, um, this this climate that like Egypt to Mesopotamia on, it's about, what, 30 degrees north or so latitude, um, is a perfect climate for growing wheat. Okay, it's got multiple seasons. Um, it's not too hot, not too cold. And where you see food uh, spread geographically is east-west. Because if you travel east-west, you are dealing with a place that has a similar climate um, and because of that, you can grow those types of crops there. Um, why you will not see this expand or, or anything really like it in the Americas is the Americas does not have a, doesn't share a lot of the same uh, lines of, uh, of latitude because um, the Americas are spread out north to south where Eurasia is east west. And that's why this is going to, you know, food is going to spread so much in Eurasia and have much bigger populations and the world's biggest empire or, you know, early, not even empires, but world uh, civilizations like the River Valley civilizations are going to be found in Eurasia rather than the Americas. All you need is a really flat rock and a fire to heat it up. At this point, the only nations in the Mediterranean powerful enough to rival each other are the Greeks and the Persians. So of course, the two of them go to war. Ever heard of Aeneas, the Battle of Marathon, Xerxes who invaded Greece in the year 300? All that yep. happens, and sure, you Persian. can learn all the names of the heroes and the battles and all that stuff, but what it really comes down to is bread versus bread and who has more bread. And the answer is the Romans. Rome, in their classic yes. move of stealing Rome was much better Greeks, agriculture. quickly adopts a bread as the food source for their new empire. Um, the agriculture and agriculture Agricultural potential of Italy, the Italian peninsula is way more than the Greek uh, peninsula there, Balkan peninsula, I guess you would say. Um, Italy has is not as divisive of a geography. It does have like the Apennine Mountains running through the, the spine of it, but it's l far less rugged. So there's a lot more arable land in Rome. Rome was geographically built to be an empire and to be one way bigger than their, you know, people that they emulated the Greeks proceed to beat everyone with their awesome new inventions for making more bread. They injected lots of bread references into their own gods, like Ceres as the equivalent of Demeter. And while Rome certainly liked the smaller ovens that Greece had come up with, they're like, yeah, but what if we did it bigger? And so they made the first bakery <laughs> Rome ovens to outfit commercial Make stuff and government bigger. bakeries to supply bread to the masses. And with that, here comes bread's latest play for world domination, politics. See, the Romans don't win over two-thirds of Europe and that big chunk of Asia and like that massive top section of Africa for nothing. They also don't do it by keeping a massive standing army or holding they have food. everyone under martial law. That would be impossible. No, the way they do it is with bread. The Roman Empire knows that everyone's really into the stuff. So to keep populations loyal to them, they set up government-sponsored welfare in the form of Cura Anonai, or a grain dole that provides grain or bread to hundreds of thousands yep. of Roman citizens. Mm -hmm. You ever hear about all those great roads that Rome built back in the day? They did it to transport bread, or at least the wheat to make the bread, which they imported from Egypt, Sicily, and other places across the empire. Empire, and then distributed to all the poor of Rome. Guess who's not going to rebel against you? People getting shipments of food from you. Remember the, the famous saying, okay, is that as long in Rome, is that as long as you give people bread and circuses, you'll always have the people's control. You always have the people's support. So feed them and entertain them. Got events like the Colosseum. Do you know the Colosseum was free for spectators? There you go. Her bread Politics. is the most efficient, portable, Matt's and doing a great job, form of nutrition the world has ever seen. All the cool kids have it, which means that everyone else wants to be a part of the in crowd and get in on those hot bread trade routes. The populations who receive bread from the empire grow from about 40,000 to about 200,000. And guess what? They stay loyal. Rome's play to win over the world with bread is best known by the phrase panem et circenses, bread oh. and circuses. <laughs> he said it. This very day because there are two things in the world that you need to keep the lowly masses placated. You give them bread and you keep them entertained. Why? Because bread wins. And when the bread runs out, so does your empire. Back in old Rome, <laughs> the systems for doling out bread to the masses become incredibly popular, as you would expect. But in the later years of the Roman Empire, their strategy starts to backfire because people simply stop working and instead wait for the emperor to just give them their bread. There's a yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't think that's exactly why the Roman Empire totally fell, is people just stopped working because they became lazy from just like government handouts. There's a lot of issues, a lot of issues about why um, bread, you know, or, or sorry, like food would, would do that. What you can say, though, is stuff like food shortages are often the last straw for some civilizations or regimes, right? There could be a lot of things going on. You're overtaxed. You don't feel like you have political representation or something like that. But for the most part, you can literally survive with those things 
that you feel are um, like oppressive. But one thing you can't just not do, though, is eat. So sometimes food is the last straw. And you could say uh, and that was going on. Food, um, Rome had that problem. Rome was overproducing uh, on their farmland for, for generations. They were not practicing smart agricultural practices. They were over-cultivating, right? It's not until like the Middle Ages where you start seeing like three-field farming, where you allow a third of your land to rest, to reheal its nutrients, right? And they also had slave labor. So labor was very, very cheap. So you could just farm, 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 and over slowly, probably almost in, in uh, um, um, you know, imperceptibly, uh, food production went a little bit less with each generation until they were only manufacturing a percentage of it. And that was a lot of that was over cultivation. Massive decline in productivity, Roman innovation, and of course, no one wants to join the army when you could just sit at home and get free stuff all the time. So Rome's <laughs> footprint begins to shrink when the bread bureaucracy gets bigger than its army. When the edges of the empire start shrinking because, like, no one's standing out there to defend it, the bread imports stop flowing, the bread doles stop doling, and the Roman Empire comes to a standstill to make way for newer, breadier competitors. From here through about the 1400s, things... Now, it's an overstatement of what happened to the, 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 the military. Um, Rome's greatest feature was also its greatest downfall, um, which was their military. Um, they spent half of the budget, the Roman Empire spent like half of the entire GDP of the giant Roman Empire simply on military maintenance, because the more they conquered, the larger an army you needed to hold that. And also a policy for Roman military history was to um, bring in military uh, to, to recruit from those peoples that you conquered. And the more that Rome did that, the more they had an army of people that weren't really connected to the culture of Rome and were more loyal to their generals than any idea of protecting Rome because those people weren't even Roman. They spread themselves too thin. Between East and West, depending on which flavor of Christianity you pick, there were only two flavors, which put you either landing in the Byzantine Empire or the Holy Roman Empire. Started All by Constantine. By powerful well, people, <laughs> by people, I mean, Roman Empire was after the, the fall Byzantine of Western Empire, Western Empire, which is headquartered in Istanbul, way back when it was Constantinople, not Istanbul. Thanks, we might be giants. Bread is the most important thing they have. Yeah, sure, they have olives and spices and whatever else from the Greeks, but to feed one million people now living in Constantinople, they needed one thing more than anything else. They need bread. The Guild of Bakers in Constantinople are considered to be a protected group at this time and no one can interfere with the making of bread in any way because everyone knows that once the bread stops getting made the city shuts down the wealthy eat the great fluffy bread the peasants continue to eat hard yucky bread and the monks are usually on a fast so the government uh, in the roman empire subsidized uh, bread production um, especially in this time in the later roman or like byzantine period uh into the byzantine empire uh Peri uh, period there guys like Diocletian and Constantine did it first who when he's the first Roman Empire to move the Roman Emperor to move the capital to what's going to be Constantinople um, they would subsidize uh, products quite a bit to ensure that uh, food food was coming out steady and also that prices were coming out steady so they would subsidize farmers uh, to help them to make sure that was a st stable thing so that kind of smart of itself. Meanwhile, over at the Holy Roman Empire, bread has already been spread to places like Gaul, where people have adopted it immediately because before they were eating porridge. Christianity is the name of the game here, but like the Romans, Gaul was Greeks conquered and way before Roman bread still Holy figures heavily into religion, which figures heavily into governing everyone. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus multiplying mm -hmm. loaves of bread and Jesus breaking bread with his disciples are all stories and ideas that figure heavily at this time. Faithfulness to God is tied to the idea of getting enough bread. Bread. Especially since everyone from all corners of Europe are eating about two pounds of bread every day. Inclu oh, and it's going to be higher than that later on. Some cultures are going to be way more than that. It's so dependent on which is a bad idea. You don't want to be completely dependent on one food product because that food product goes away. You're going to starve. Look at like Irish potato famine or again, French Revolution. Uh, people are eating so much th of that, that when uh, blight, you know, or uh, whatever the specific thing was that was killing off ingredients to make bread in France, they were so dependent on it that when it went down, people were starving. Including using it as plates, which they call trenches. Bread is so central to both <laughs> the Holy plate. Romans and the Byzantines that government like bread starts stepping in to control it using soup? methods mm. like price fixing. They set the price of bread low enough to be affordable, yeah. which was another bread invention that continues to this very Dude, day. Matt's hitting but all the major as soon points. As you lose the bread, you Does he do a lot of history-related videos? 
After a couple centuries of bad plagues job. throughout Byzantium, the vulnerable empires left open and some neighbors start conquering the lands that produce the grain. And you know the story by this point, it's the beginning of the end. Slowly, the Byzantines become disorganized and fall to the Turks, who, surprise, surprise, control the grain-making areas of Eastern Europe and the Middle East. So, yeah. I mean, that wasn't, yeah, that was until 1453. It was a thousand years um, of Constantinople, you know, and, and, which was Constantinople basically is the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine Empire is the Roman Empire because um, basically the Western Rome, the Western half of Rome fell, right? Uh, 476 officially final emperor getting booted out and the East would survive for another thousand years. You get it, right? We've been through what, five empires now? I think you're starting to get the picture that bread is responsible for the history of the world. But you know what? I can hear your skeptical comments. Yeah, Matt Pat, but that was then. The world has gone gluten-free at this point. We don't fight with pole arms anymore. Modern people stopped caring about bread long ago, right? Wrong. Throughout the centuries of Gaul, which became what we now know as France, the biggest uprisings and rebellions all centered around a shortage of bread. The grown rebane and Lyon in 1529, poor grain harvests lead to the working peasants having no bread. So thousands of them break into the city's granaries to take back the grain from the government. 1590, there's a siege in Paris where normally Parisians are eating one and a half to two and a half pounds of bread a day. They become so desperate for bread during the months long siege, they grind human bones to make bread flour, which ultimately leads to the king surrendering and France Ooh, I didn't know that. religions. Fast forward to the 1760s. Gross. Yeah, um, the 1500s were pretty rough for, for Central Europe. Um, this is your wars of religion as a result of the Protestant Reformation. You're going to get, uh, you know, things like um, the Thirty Years' War, which is devastating. War always, food is always tied with war. It's one of the things that's necessary for it, and often wars create famines. And if you are totally, you know, hooked on one type of food and you have a war, it becomes harder to produce said food, therefore riots you know that can happen all right paris france k okay, we're leading up to the french revolution bread was a huge part of totally this. unregulated grain production leads to extremely high prices on bread and people Couldn't afford start it. to starve in 1775 people start rioting for bread this isn't called the french revolution at the time it's called the flower war because people are seriously hangry without their baguettes yep. 1789 and you think the storming of the bastille was all about getting weapons it was about getting bread sure the mobs had their torches and their pitchforks but you know what they were looking for the royal store of grain they were Whoa. literally Starving. Marie Antoinette is painted as a villain. Not as much in the Bastille itself. Bastille, they store in the Bastille for gunpowder because the king was basically uh, fighting against the. There's a lot of things we could have done. Fighting against the National Assembly and all that stuff. Um, that storming for food was all over the countryside in France. So, you know, with food becoming more scarce, and I remember they're feudal at this time. Most people, 90% of people in France were peasant farmers, um, totally reliant on their Lord to provide said food. And as food was becoming scarce because of the famines going on, uh, especially in the 1780s, it was really bad in the 1780s. Uh, people on the verge of starvation were storming the homes of nobles because they, they, they thought that nobles were hoarding food. So they would go attack them violently in a lot of cases. It killed a lot of them all across the countryside while you had the political upheaval and, of course, the, the starvation in Paris itself. But, yeah, they were storming all the nobles for, for food there because French, French diet was so dependent on bread. She hears about the flour shortages and famously says, them eat cage. De la brioche. Probably never said that. Mean, let them eat cake. It actually means let them eat brioche, which is a luxury form and of enriched bread because bread is still considered. Probably never said that. There's no good evidence eating. for it. She probably didn't even actually say this, but the power of a statement about bread is the single most famous and inflammatory quote to come out of the entirety of the French Revolution. But maybe it's just France, right? They're a bit nutty for their bread. Madame <laughs> Deficit. No, not by a long shot. Time right, to check in on another famous about? empire, the British. the British. Sorry, Tom. She's included here as well. The British Empire, famous for taxing early American colonists on tea, are actually plagued with another big problem in the years leading up to the American Revolution, bread shortages. While not as famous as the Boston Tea Party, in 1775, thousands of poor American colonists protest from Philadelphia to Salem about the shortages of grain and the incredibly high bread prices, most of which are controlled by the British government. In an yeah, Amer uh, the, the American colonists were bound to the British for, for their goods. It was illegal to get goods from other countries. Um, so we're reliant on them, okay? Totally reliant on them. 
article it's illegal by to get Barbara anywhere Clark else. Smith, she writes, quote, thousands were reported clamoring for bread, and crowds escorted a merchant, a butcher, and a speculator accused of raising prices to the city jail. As it happened in Boston two years earlier, crowds I've never really the mentioned this in that and punish enemies of the patriot cause. Once again, the enemy of the bread is the enemy of the people. And wouldn't you know it, one little revolution later, and things really start taking off for that new country of America. <laughs> and why is Wash that? Washington was crossing the Delaware because on the other side there was a bakery. Because <laughs> wheat is produced in almost every state in the entire country. Heck, we have a specific region called the Wheat Belt. We're always singing about our amber waves of grain. I think it's an accident that the U.S. became a global superpower over the last few hundred years. It should be when you look at how much bread we have. Today well, add to that the incredible, you know, when you get the Industrial Revolution, the mechanization of farmland became so freaking uh, productive in America. Today we export almost 50 million tons of wheat every year. Let's just say that policies around producing wheat can get pretty heated, so I'm not going to be going into all that. But to give you an indication, the U.S. government has paid out over $48 billion in wheat subsidies since 1995, all to support wheat production in this country because, once again, say it with me, bread is power. Whew, and with that, we are at the present day. Food. Whew, that took a lot yes. out of me. I hope I've convinced you now that the entire history of the world comes down to bread, and all you have to do is follow who has the bread at any given time. But if you've been watching this channel for a while, you should probably be asking yourself one thing. Why bread? Like, why? Why not any other food item in the entire okay, world? I'm good. Sure, uh, yeah, I want delicious. to hear this. But so are baked potatoes, and you could grow those pretty easily. So are beans, and eh, no, beans suck. But you they can't store better. Them. So why not something like the legume civilization? That's a question that was on the mind of one particular cultural anthropologist, Dr. James C. Scott of Yale University, who went and wrote an entire book observing that if you wanted to build an early civilization, you needed to have a grain-based economy, because grain was the only way to have an economy in the first place. If you notice something throughout this episode, it's that people used bread to get what they wanted. Sure, they ate the bread, but they also traded bread to get everything else they needed. You see, at the end of the day, bread isn't just the food source of all these civilizations, it's also the currency. Sure, they may have had gold okay. coins or fancy little francs or whatever, but that's all bogus if everyone is starving. Bread is power because bread is literally money that you can eat. And the rulers of all these empires, they know that. Remember, most of these empires relied on giving free bread to people. Grain was the basis of taxation in all these empires because in order to give food to people who don't have it, you need to take it away from the people who do. And why are you taking grain? Well, grain like wheat is Waiting special for, a moment for to three interject big reasons. Here. First, it's transportable. You need it if you're going to have a big empire with a- Okay, good. Okay, he's bringing in the, 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 the components of it. Um... Yeah, I'm going to let him do it because and I'll, and I'll fill in because there's some imp important points he needs to make here for wheat exclusivity, bread, you know, whatever. Huge transportation network for food. And what makes something easy to transport? Number two, being light and dry. So right. it's not going to rot and you won't be carrying around a whole bunch of water weight. Immediately, you could start to see from these criteria that crops like potatoes, lotus roots, most other root starches, they're all out. Potatoes are... They also rot. 70 to 80 percent water by weight and water it's heavy they didn't have dehydrated instant flakes back in the day which also meant that they weren't able to easily divide up something like a potato wheats and grains they're very divisible you can weigh them out down to the tenth of an ounce so you know exactly how much you're getting or how much you're giving away when you're portioning out doles to the peasants it also grows number three above ground which doesn't seem like it should be that big of a deal easy to farm everything to these empires remember the entire idea of a central government only exists if that government's able to collect taxes from the citizens. Again, these taxes aren't money, they're crops. When someone's growing wheat, they can't hide it. You can literally see the wheat growing months before okay. harvest season. So a tax assessor can roll on by and estimate a farmer's yield. For I never thought of then that. You come by at the I never thought of that. So what he's saying is like, you can't, <laughs> you can't hide it. You can't like secretly grow it, right? And then be like, yeah, when when the <laughs> when the census comes around and they're, they're uh, getting ready to figure out how much your taxes are going to be, uh, yeah, you can't hide it. That's brilliant. I, I never thought of that. That's e it's harder to hide from the government. <laughs> The same precise time every year, and you take your cut right as everything's getting harvested. Potatoes, root veggies, some beans, they're not visible. They're grown underground. Nobody well, talks about how easy it is That to means grow. the farmers can more easily hide them from the government. They can tell the tax collector, oh yeah, we had ourselves a terrible harvest this year. Barely any potatoes, but here's your 10%, I guess. And the tax collector would have no way to know if they were lying. They're a great crop if you're a tax evader, which means that they're terrible if you're a government that's trying <laughs> to collect taxes. A True. terrible example of governments only just being interested in wheat happened during the Irish potato a famine in the 1840s. During this time, it's well known that the Irish were super reliant on potatoes as one of their only food sources. Yeah, it was, it was like 10 pounds of potatoes a day like people would eat. It was crazy. 
Interesting because uh, potatoes are not native to, to Ireland either. Um, they come from South America. There are lots of reasons for that, but any idea why they didn't have any wheat around during this period? Well, they did, but a large portion of it was being exported to the British for compulsory payments to the government, who owned Ireland at the time. So, because wheat was easy to transport, it's the British, the British huh? were more than happy to take it all. Well, the hundreds of no thousands the Irish of hate Irish the British. people died because of the failure of their less taxable potato crop. Yeah. So, there it is, we're done. Wheat runs the whole world. What? I didn't talk about the whole world? I forgot about all those other continents, like South America. That okay, good. Okay, get to interject now. Um, wheat. Okay, so um, as you can see, it can grow in uh, a, a very a, a large geography of the United or the United States of the planet. Okay, see that around thirty degrees north, all over the place, um, and higher. You can get places that can be colder, like that actually can get uh, like snow. You can still you can still do that. Now, Egypt and Mesopotamia were important too because what you saw with those uh, places was also at the at a similar time probably at a, about the same time they overlap was the domestication of animals now the um, it was so easy to 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 grow because basically what you do like in the nile right you got the very fertile um nile and the and the ground you know up to it uh, next to it and basically all you had to do okay was let your cattle right um stomp around the dirt in the mud, whatever it is, stomp around, which provides little holes, right, for um, you to do seeds. And you basically could just walk by throwing the seeds, right? You don't have to plant them individually like you would with a lot of underground crops. You could just throw them out, right? Throw them out there. And, uh, and, and the animals bury the seeds pretty much. And then, you know, smooth it out or whatever. And then you grow. It was very easy to grow. So you saw this grow and it's it's no wonder why wheat started also in the same places where the world's uh, best domesticated animals that were used for agriculture there you marry those two together that's why you get that wheat explosion in the places that it did the entire eastern part of asia most of the continent of africa all of australia yeah you're right i didn't i didn't actually forget about them but i did focus on the areas of history that this audience is probably most familiar with but that's not nearly the end of the story so here's how the mighty bread plays out in the rest of the world the secret okay. friends is this having wheat in your country isn't about being smarter than other countries around you it's not about having better weapons or more technology or Geography. whatever it's all luck the reason central and southern africa didn't figure heavily into the bread wars over the last few thousand years is that these areas weren't well suited for growing grain anybody getting uh okay if you took if you took um probably a, a basic freshman level world history class okay in college i'm trying to look for it probably read uh guns germs and steel right guns germs and steel which talks about this Rains. Wheat, as it turns out, is a little bit picky about where it grows, and it needs temperate climates and loamy soil. That's great if you're in the Fertile Crescent, but crummy if you're in the Ivory Coast. If you look at the world map of where grains grow on this planet, you'll notice a few conspicuous absences. It's within about 20 degrees of geography. South and Central America, as well as a huge portion of the African continent, Northeastern Asia, and in Central Australia. Primarily because most of these places, they're too hot. We can see that these areas won't be able to come into power using bread alone like us cheaters in seasons. Europe, North America, and Central Asia. Their stories play out much like our own, only using a different cereal crop, corn. Corn, or maize, if you're not speaking American English, was a staple crop of Mesoamerican civilizations over yonder in Central and South mm -hmm. America. As we've said repeatedly throughout this episode, the history of civilization is really the history of grains. Again, offering those He's three definitely read Guns, Guns Gerbs, and Steel. That is easily used transportable, it. it's easily measurable, and it's clearly visible to keep farmers from evading their taxes. And much like the Greeks and Romans infused wheat into their mythology, Mesoamerican mythology swaps corn. all of that out with corn. The Aztecs had Santiaro, the maize god, who we see surrounded by corn, while the Mayans take the idea of grain, and specifically maize, and turn it into the building block of human civilization. You can see it's the same thing that happens, whether it's food product, it ties to religion. Always does, because nature controls food production, gods control nature, so please the gods. Literally, where the Mayan creation myth begins with humanity literally being sculpted from dry corn. And, just like other civilizations, they had other options to choose from, like potatoes. But freeze-drying these make South it America, though. took an incredibly long time. Whereas corn, it could be dry and white Empire, on the stalk. Especially. After the decline of the Mayans and Aztecs, largely because of changes to the climate that kept them from producing enough corn, you see the Incas Probably. further south in Peru spreading their influence, knowledge, and culture through, say it with me now, bread. Only this time, it was bread made from corn. The Incas were master agricultural 
engineers. And rather than just outright conquering Terrace neighboring farming. people groups, they just showed up and said, hey, how about we help you grow better corn? And everyone's like, yeah, I'll take that. And the Incan Empire thrives until the Europeans show up and ruin everything like they tend to. Bringing it all back together <laughs> into one unified timeline. On the other end of the world, stay with me here, this is gonna get tricky. Asia? The same, same thing, thing happens yeah. again. Zooming in on the <laughs> other side of the ocean and looking at that grain map again, get a big old pocket in this middle area of China that's a good place to grow grain, which is why grain appears right there on the national emblem of China. Except this time we're not talking about wheat or corn, we're talking rice. Well, the ancient Egyptians were becoming an early- uh, Rice didn't come from China. Uh, uh, it became the, the big crop was down in Southeastern Asia, more like Vietnam. At least the, the, the real popular rice, I should say, the popular form of rice we use today, uh, goes back to Champa rice, came out from Vietnam made it uh, way north into China and exploded the Chinese population. After civilization through the power of wheat, Asia had a growing empire of its own in what we now know as modern day China. And just like civilizations took off in ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt because the conditions were just right for growing grains, we can see a similar pattern throughout Asian history. If you wanted to support a government that could collect taxes and efficiently distribute food as a resource, you needed to have conditions that were right for grains. Enter the balmy, humid Yangtze River Valley, perfect for rice cultivation and the cradle of Chinese civilization. Same with the Yellow River, much though. the same way that the Fertile Crescent was for Mesopotamia. You may have heard about Both the rivers. Three Kingdoms period in ancient Chinese history, where three rival states existed, the Shu, the Wu, and the Wei. It probably comes as no surprise that for each of these three kingdoms, you can trace the source of their power to some ideal condition that allowed them to cultivate rice. Shu had the Sejuan Basin, Wei had the Yellow River Valley, and Wu had the Lower Yangtze River. In the same way that grain was a source of government power in the Western world, rice and the conditions for growing it represented power in the Eastern world. I'm not sure rice isn't always made into bread, it is made into buns and noodles and all kinds of bread adjacent products. It also functions in the same way as bread and most importantly of all, drives the same power dynamic that fuels yeah, the everything same effect. in history. So there you have it friends, the history of the world is all just bread. In the future, is it possible video, that the history of the man. world will still rely on something as simple as bread even in the face of all the weapons and technology and AI and Amazon? Yeah, I think it will. Follow the bread and you'll always see who's in the power seat. Now if you'll excuse me after making it through the last few tens of thousands of years of history, I want a little slice of toast and as always my friends remember it's just a theory a food theory bon appetit and it yeah. Hey, if you're interested in more food history, check out how coffee single-handedly caused human enlightenment. No joke, the science that we have available to us today is solely thanks to the humble coffee bean. That video is on screen right now, so make sure you click it. And as always, my friends, I'll see you next week. Have I found a new channel, a popular one, that like is relevant to what I do? You guys are gonna have to let me know. Final thoughts before you go. Don't go anywhere. Dude, I'm super impressed with this video. I'm super impressed. Uh, uh, Matt Pat went back and, you know, uh, most of the stuff you, you could find in a, uh, you know, college level textbook. OK, you know, like a freshman level textbook. You could I could see the guns, germs and steel um, influence there talking about the the tie between the birth of civilization and geography and power and geography. So um, saw all that. And yeah, it was great to, to put down there. Uh, that was fantastic. I learned a bunch of things. Hopefully I was able to add a bunch of things um, as well to it. Maybe fill in some gaps, get my perspective there. But yeah, so much of what we talk is uh, an important part of, of history. And I know with, you know, teaching, teaching history that uh, you, you have to talk about these things because um, it's food is everything. Food is everything, right? In the history of civilization, it changes everything. Um, so anyway, without going a long drawn uh, 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 thing about that uh, with, with food, I think I, I made my comments pretty clear. And Matt, incredible job there. And again, I thought that he was leaving, you know, kind of YouTube. So maybe this is one of the final projects there. Um, if he's been making stuff of this quality that has to do with history, I've been missing out. So if you have more suggestions for me, drop them off at the Discord. Um, again, I got this uh, uh, promoted over there or suggested to me. So uh, if you want to, um, you know, share another video like this, let me know. Go over to the Discord server, drop in the video suggestions channel. All right, with that, you guys, we'll see you next time. Bye.